not only are you getting a presentation by Dr. Richard McKenzie, you're going to hear some music from Guy Wonder, uh, former frontman of the power supergroup Super Fairy from Hilo, Hawaii, now co-founding member of Ratlung, and also a uh, leader and organiz organizer of Shoemaker Levy, which is some of the soundtracks I'm going to try to play in the background of the presentation. So hopefully this is going to be fun. It's going to work out. It's going to be a little education. You learn a little bit about mangroves. Maybe you'll like the music. Maybe you won't, but you can, you can turn the sound down if you don't. So anyway, that's, that's what we're going to do today. Is there anything else you needed to say, Liza, or do you want me to take over? Take over, man. All right. Grove. So we're going to go to the mangroves. All right, there we are. Let's see, we got Christians joining us all the way from Hilo, Hawaii. Aloha Kakayaka. All right. I've got two screens here too, so I'm not, I'm, if I look away, I'm, I'm focusing on, uh, on the screen. Okay, can you guys all see that? Yes. Excellent. I'm also, I need to put my glasses on. So before I start the presentation, I know there are several people here that are familiar with mangroves or have heard me talk about them. And I'm curious, when you hear the word mangrove, besides having the word awesome pop up in your mind, in your head, what are some of the goods and services that we know that mangroves provide to us? And you can type that, either shout it out or type it in the, in the chat session. And I can't see the chat, Liza, so I don't know if you want to read them, read them back to me. Absolutely. We've got <clears throat> storm protection. Awesome. Nursery for sea life. Perfect. Let's see. Um, what else do we have here? Food. Yep. Cool crabs. Bird habitat. Whoever, whoever typed that, I love that one. Yep, cool crabs. Uh, preventing soil erosion. Perfect. Carbon sinks. Yes. Ooh, mangrove snapper. Kathy Wolf. Ooh, yum. Mm -hmm. Now you're making me hungry. I haven't had my I am yet. hungry. Yeah. Yummy smells. Uh, yeah, yes. Wow. That's a creative one. Yeah. We've got some the, good ones here. Are... Snor snorkeling haven. Snorkeling haven. I, I, I think you guys, you hit a lot of them on the head. So... Wait, wait talk... let me add a couple more, please. Okay. Sediment retention. Yep. Cool roots, grunts and grits. Grunts and grits. Yeah. I like that one. Wicked cool wildlife. Man, folks Wicked are cool. really creative. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. Pollutant filtration. Yep. I think we're getting all of them. Everybody. So this is when I talk about ecosystem services, these are the five sort of main ones I talk about, and I think everybody's hit on them. Fisheries habitat, water quality, um, they provide wildlife habitat for not only fish, but it's just some really cool bird species and bat species. And this is a Madagascar tree frog that I found uh, when we were sampling a site out there and um, just really cool animals. Um, tigers and, and the cinder bonds, which I have yet to see. Uh, storm protection, somebody mentioned. And then the big one is carbon storage, blue carbon. And this is uh, this has kind of become the big topic lately because a lot, of, uh, a lot of countries are trying to lower their greenhouse gas emissions and mangroves are proving to be a, a really awesome nature-based solution at doing that. Um, you know, they, they're, they only represent about half a percent of all of the coastline in the world, yet they uh, are believed to uh, store 70% of the carbon from the ocean sediments. So they're huge carbon stocks. Um, but before we like really, it, it sounds like everybody's got a good grasp of the ecosystem services. And, but I, I think it's important to understand why mangroves provide all these awesome services. And so I think in order, but to do that, we need to sort of step back and I'm gonna offer you what I call my mangroves 101. And this will kind of walk us through like what mangroves are and and how come they're so awesome. Um, and you can see in this map here that mangroves are located in the tropics and the subtropics. They grow along the coasts. And uh, I'm not sure if you can see my, 
my pointer. Oh, I forgot I can do laser pointer. Can you all see that? Um, yes. The, the largest areas of mangroves are in the Indo-Pacific here. So Indonesia, I believe, has the largest extent of, of mangroves um, in the world. And so this sort of is a, a nice map showing you um, where, where these mangroves are from. Now, another really cool thing about mangroves is like, I know we've got some foresters online and when I, we talk about oak trees, we're usually talking about Quercus, right? The genus Quercus, am I saying that wrong or right? I'm not sure. If we're talking about like a maple forest, we're talking about Acer. But when we're talking about mangrove, mangrove is, it's, it's a more of a, it's not about a phylo, phylogeny. It's not about a certain like Acer tree or a Quercus tree. It's more about adaptation. And so the word mangrove um, comes from uh, probably it's the early 17th century from the, the Portuguese word uh, mangue. And I apologize if I, I my pronunciation is horrible um, or the Spanish mangle. And these were terms that they were associated with uh, uh, groves of forest growing along the coasts. And so, and then that, that, that mangle mang sort of formed into mangrove to the, to the to the term we have now. So again, it, it's this incredible type of forest that uh, is comprised of over uh, 17 different genera. And if we go back to this map now, so the epicenter for mangroves, where it all started was, was right here in the Indo-Pacific. And so that's where we, we, the mangroves started and then they started to radiate and, and, and um, evolve into uh, different uh, families and, and genera and species. And we basically we can break down into two groups in the world. We have on um, this portion of the of the of the world, they're referred to as the Indo-West Pacific mangroves, or the IWP, as the cool people call them, the cool kids. And so, how many how many species do you think are present in the Indo-West Pacific? Again, you can type or you can shout it out. We have forty-two from Christian. See. Higher. Higher. Going once. Anybody want to take a guess? It's not graded today. 57 from Allison. The answer is 2033 is another no, one. That's too high. Uh, 140. 58. Allison, ding, ding, ding. You were the closest. Allison, price 58, is right. 58 true species have evolved in the Indo-West Pacific. And then on the other side of the world, we have uh, our second group of, of mangroves, which are referred to as the Atlantic Eastern Pacific, or as the cool kids refer to it, the AEP. So do you think there are less or more species in, these man in, in, the, in the Atlantic Eastern Pacific? More or less? Less, Everyone's almost everyone is saying less here. And they are correct. There are only 12 species there, so. Wow. We have uh, almost, uh, we have 70 species of true mangroves and most of them are found in the, in the Indo-West Pacific. So uh, very, very cool fact about mangroves that you guys can, you can uh, take, take home with you in case you're on Jeopardy or, or some other game show. Um, and, and also, so mangroves, they grow along the coast of the, of, uh, you know, tropics and the subtropics. And when I think I think tropics or subtropics, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to the beach. I'm going to get some sunscreen. I'm going to get a, maybe a pina colada or 10. Uh, I'm going to get my surfboard and I'm going to try and surf. Uh, Cause that, I mean, I think it's just beautiful, sunny waves, ocean beach, but that's not where mangroves like to grow. They prefer to grow in hot, salty conditions where there are millions of mosquitoes. It smells like farts, but they grow there and and they and they like and they thrive there, which is amazing because the the conditions that they're growing in these these uh, um, I mean these these areas they get flooded at least twice a day by the ocean, and as a result, you get this sort of waterlogged, anaerobic, really bad conditions for plants. Like plants are not very happy in these conditions, but mangroves are, and that's what we're going to talk about next. Is we're going to look at why how mangroves have adapted to do that. But before I do that, I forgot to click a hyperlink. Okay, so we'll put a little ambiance on here, a little background music. Okay, so back to the presentation. So let's take a closer look. 
let's take a look at uh, at, at the mangroves and, and see look at some of the conditions that these plants have to have to have to live in so we're going to zoom in oh that's not going to work Oh, I won't just click on this. Stand by. Okay. Let's zoom in. Let's take a closer look at the sediments here. Okay, so on the left, okay, first of all, uh, my my partner lo looked at this last night and she told me that these look like Angry Birds. And I assure you, I made these cartoons way before Angry Birds was even a game. So before that was even a cool thing. But if on the left side of the presentation here, you see a terrestrial forest soil, and you've got roots and you've got soil. And in between those gaps, you have these spaces that are filled with oxygen. And these are conditions that plants like. They like to be able to breathe. The roots need to breathe. And if we look at the mangrove sediments, you can see that that pore space is filled with water. And not just water, it's filled with salty, salty seawater. So there's no oxygen. There's, there's salt water, which plants don't like. Um, it just, again, conditions that, that, that plants aren't happy in, but these, these, these mangrove forests thrive in it. And so somehow they've evolved to tolerate being in, in the salty conditions and in uh, muds that, uh, that, that no, not only is there no oxygen, but because of that, there are these buildup of these, these metals, these reduced metals, manganese iron, which can be toxic to roots and plant systems. So let's go back to, to our forest here. And this is my buddy Ting, by the way, from Hanoi, uh, up on a rhizophora tree here. So one of the first ways the trees and mangrove plants have adapted to live in these systems is that they need fresh water, right? And so if we zoom in and look at their leaves, you can see there are these salt crystals that are on the bottom and on the top. And so they have this ability to essentially distill the salt water and extract that fresh water so that they can grow but then they have to get rid of the salt. And so what you find are, are salt deposits on leaves, on roots, on branches, on trunks. Um, and so that's that's the first way that they've adapted uh, to live in, in these, um, these salty conditions and grow. Now, that's pretty cool. You're telling me why well, I won't just go back. So, you're saying to yourself, Rich, that's really cool that they can grow in these salty environments, but how do they breathe? How, how do they tolerate these anoxic, waterlogged uh, sediment conditions? And to get an answer to that, we're gonna look, take a closer look at the prop root on this tree here. We're gonna zoom in and you can see these little circles on, on this root here. These are called lenticels. And if we zoom in closer to that lenticel, and see that they're basically just openings in, in the root. And it allows oxygen to diffuse through those holes down the, the main root uh, in this, and eventually to these, these sort of uh, uh, fine roots uh, as depicted in this incredible drawing, this realistic drawing I've, I've provided here. And what this does is it allows the oxygen to build this sort of like it's like a like if you're watching Star Trek. It's like a, a, a you know your, your force field, your shield. Your shields are up, and so these iron manganese, when they hit this oxic area, they they really they become oxidized, and they can't really have that toxic effect on the plant. So this allows the the plant to be able to tolerate living without in these like anoxic, smelly, smelly sediments. The other benefit is it, they. These, these roots have, these fine roots are continually being turned over. They're constantly producing these roots uh, in order to survive, again, living in these conditions. And because of that, you get this buildup of carbon. And this is why mangroves are such a big carbon topic right now, because these fine roots are growing and they're accumulating. There's a high turnover because they, they don't live very long. And as a result, you get all of these fine roots and all this carbon stored in this water-saturated, anaerobic uh, conditions. There's no oxygen. And because there's no oxygen, the bacteria that like to break down that carbon, they can't because they can't breathe. And so you could essentially have carbon stored for millennia, for thousands of years in the sediments of these mangroves if it's left undisturbed. And because of that, you find these really, really high uh, amounts of carbon in, in these mangrove sediments. Uh, I think that was all I wanted to say about that.
And this is, someone said uh, goods and services, they said cool roots. And I totally agree. Um, and you're going to see a lot of pictures of roots and mud uh, in this presentation because that's what I study and that's what I love. And they're just, I mean, look, look at this picture. It's so cool. I mean, you've got, uh, this is uh, uh, my buddy Burson and, and Maybelline uh, sampling a mangrove tree with these really cool uh, prop roots. If you look in the middle picture here, there are three different types of roots in here. You've got these knee roots uh, that are bending here. You've got these like pointy nematophores, which you can also see on the right side. Uh, they're sort of, uh, my friend Dom calls them upside down ice cream cones. And, uh, and then you've got prop roots in this picture as well. So again, all of these, these roots uh, are allowing oxygen to fuse down into the sediment and create these sort of oxic areas that the trees can really, really thrive in. And this is probably my favorite root. These are ribbon roots from the Xylocarpus tree. Um, it's just really cool, like awesome groovy roots just undulating in the sediments and amazing. And, and this picture on the left, uh, this is Maybelline and BJ on the right uh, for scale. You could just see this gigantic Xylocarpus tree with these really awesome ribbony buttress roots. And the roots also help stabilize because again, these, these are pretty soft sediments, right? And so these roots help stabilize these massive trunks of these trees so that they can grow um, in, in, these, in these conditions. And so those roots, in addition to providing like all of this carbon for us, they also provide us with improved water quality because as that water that's got all the sediment flows through the mangrove uh, trees, you can see in this cartoon here, this is a wetland, but it's the same, it's the same concept. As the water flows through these vegetated areas, it slows down and any of the particles, any sediments that are in the water are deposited because the water no longer has the energy to carry those sediments. And as a result, we get uh, improved water quality. So mangroves can protect reef systems that are adjacent to them by trapping these sediments and as well as the nutrients that are there. This also results in incredibly muddy systems. If you've ever gone through them, they're really fun. Uh, this is uh, my friend Pono in Pohnpei, and she's literally up to her knees in sediment, really soft, soft, uh, gooey sediment. So these roots also provide us with another benefit, which is storm protection. And this has been fairly well documented in the last, in the last decade, where, again, you have these trunks and these roots, these structures, and as the seawater flows through them, it slows it down. So if you have a typhoon or a tsunami, the, these trees can significantly reduce the wave energy that's generated by these storms, and as a result, protect any inland areas, whether it's a small village, whether it's a city or a large urban area. And it's, I think that on the order of, for every 100 meters of mangroves, you can get a reduction, something like 50% uh, in, in the wave, maybe it's 30 to 40% in the wave action. And we saw this, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, 2004 with the Indian Ocean tsunami, which was the, the deadliest tsunami to date. Uh, I think it killed over 230,000 people. It was a 9.1 earthquake uh, that was uh, generated in Indonesia. Um, and when scientists started to look around the coasts of some of these areas, like in India here, uh, they found that areas that were behind intact mangroves uh, suffered much less damage than villages that uh, weren't protected. And so you can see that in this cartoon here, this is uh, this GIS image, where the dark green shaded areas represent intact forest. And these black circles represent villages. So these villages were not affected by uh, the, the tsunami, by the waves, but the village in front of the mangrove was completely damaged, as well as were some of these other villages south of this forest, because again, they didn't have this, this buffer, this mangrove buffer in front of them. Uh, again, one of the, the benefits that mangroves provide because they, they've adapted to grow these phenomenal root systems. The roots also provide fish habitat for several species of fish, mostly coral uh, fish, uh, although there are some resident mangrove fish that also benefit from these roots. But basically when the system is flooded and the water comes onto the surface of the mangrove, the fish can, can swim in with that water. And we found that these, these baby juvenile fish that are coming in from the reef, um, from an adjacent reef, can hide in the roots in these nooks and crannies. So these pneumatophores, these knee roots have all these little spaces and they can avoid being eaten by these larger fish. They can to a degree in the prop roots, 
although there's space, as you can see here, for uh, bigger fish to get into. So some protection, but maybe not as much as, as these other root systems. Uh, but still really valuable because uh, other studies have found that, okay, so because of that, this nursery habitat, these, these little fish can swim in there, baby fish can swim and hide and they can grow into, you know, juvenile fish and swim out to the reef and talk back to their parents and, you know, be a juvenile fish. Uh, but they found that there was a significantly more biomass of fish, of reef fish, like parrotfish or, or snappers in reef systems that were adjacent to um, mangrove forests than in reefs that were where mangroves had been cut down or were absent. And that is uh, indicated here uh, in this cartoon um, above and below, where the below cartoon, they've cut the mangroves down. So that uh, is another benefit of these root systems. So we're gonna go back and to our friend Ting in the forest here. And before I do, is the music too loud or is it distracting? Should I shut it off? <clears throat> I, I, oh, we're, we're seeing down in a volume a bit. Okay. Stand by. Is that better? I like that better. I think that's oh. a great volume. Can, okay. can still I, hear it. I apologize for not doing that. I meant to do that earlier. I just got excited when I started talking about mud. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, so we've kind of learned a little bit of how mangroves have adapted to live in these conditions. And, you know, another uh, big thing that they need to do is, is to reproduce. Let me turn this down a little bit more. And so I've shared with you that the, um, the conditions in these forests, specifically in the mud, they're not, they're not ideal conditions for plants, especially seeds. Imagine being a seed, uh, settling on, on these conditions and having to germinate where there's no oxygen you've got all these like nasty uh heavy metals that want to attack you and and uh and there's salt so again not not really conducive to plants but mangroves figured it out and they've evolved if we take a closer look here um, a really fascinating way uh, for seed dispersal and so you get that the flowers grow on the tree and then you get the seeds start to form and then uh, they're the vivip the viviparous it's a hard word to say sometimes uh the viviparous seedlings which means that they they essentially germinate while they're still attached to the tree and so they go from a seed to a essentially a seedling while they're still on the tree which is pretty cool because when when they fall into the water or they fall into the sediments they're like ready to go they've already got some of these adaptations um growing within them and they can colonize these again these harsh muddy sediments that most plants would just die. Um, and also the, the really cool thing is the diversity in, in propagules. So you have these like elongated sort of cigar shaped um, propagules like on rhizophora trees. Uh, they look like giant pickles. They have these little bumps on them. Um, these little uh, pear shaped, uh, this is an Avicennia tree, a small, small um, propagule that they produce. Also these, these propag the, the rhizophora propagules, these long cigar shaped, um, propagules can be anywhere from, you know, uh, 20 centimeters long to I've seen one that was half half a meter long. They're, they can be enormous. Um, this is a sonoradia up here. Uh, that's uh, it's it's a uh, propagule that drops into the into the water. It's very small. Um, and this is my favorite one here in the lower right. Um, this is a xylocarpus. It's a puzzle fruit. And when it hits the ground, it splits open and there's like maybe six or seven pieces of it's like a puzzle you can put back together. And those float off and colonize some other other muddy substrate and grow into adult trees. So this is how mangroves have um, evolved to adapt, again, to live in, in these harsh conditions um, and how they've evolved to reproduce in those conditions. And so those are the trees that live in these systems and, and how they've evolved uh, to, to tolerate these conditions. But there's also animals that live in these systems as well, that it's all, it's essentially like a mutualistic relationship where they also benefit the trees and the trees benefit them. And so um, let's take a closer look at some of these guys. So we zoom in here and you can see, uh, I hope you can see, there's all these little burrows right here. And these little balls on the on the sediment, those are, those are little poops. And those are all from this little guy right here, this cute little uh, sasarmid crab. 
And so these are a, a dominant uh, organism that's in, in these systems. And I'll explain here how they benefit the trees and vice versa. And there are three main groups of crabs that we can find in there. Uh, the first are these uh, uca, would be the, the, the genus for this crab, or a fiddler crab. You probably are familiar with these or have seen them. Um, the male, we've got two males here, where they have these giant uh, uh, claws that they, they use to uh, engage in these incredible mating dances. If you've ever, if you ever have a chance to, to just stop and watch, it's just amazing. They just wave these giant pinchers around trying to attract the female in. And they also have these like battles, these battle royales between each other where they just fight with these claws and they flip each other over. It's really awesome. Um, I, I get, when I'm in the field working, my, my colleagues usually get frustrated with me because I'll end up like watching these crabs because they just, they're just really fascinating. And they're also gorgeous. I mean, look at the colors on these things. I mean, talk about art. I mean, this is nature art in its finest. You've got this brilliant turquoise female fiddler crab here and this cute little red fiddler crab looking up at me. Um, the coloration is just phenomenal. Um, and the next, the next group of crabs is probably, I have to say, my most favorite animal on the, on the, in the world, aside from my chewarier, Lily. Um, and that would be the cisarmid tree crabs. And this is a completely different family of crab. You can see uh, they're sort of hiding from me on this, this tree here, really, really cute. Um, and also super colorful. So we've got, uh, I can't tell if these are males or females because you have to look at the, at the, the telson, but uh, royal blue, dark red, um, amazing, amazing coloration on, on these, on these Sasarmid crabs. Uh, here's a purple one. Um, and I mean, just look at the, the turquoise color on this crab is, is just amazing. Um, and so, and they're not only beautiful and, and super fun to watch and try to catch, but they're, they're beneficial uh, to the forest. So they, these crabs, the Sasarmid crabs, they, they like to eat leaves. And so you can see there's a, um, a crab there that's gobbling up this leaf on the, on the right. And uh, on the left, you can see a crab is pulling the, the leaf into its burrow. And so they help in the, again, talking about carbon, they help the carbon uh, cycling with it in these systems in that they break down these leaves and incorporate it into the soils, again, resulting in these high carbon stocks in, the, in these sediments. And they've done studies where they've, they've doubled the amount of leaves that are on the, they've gone out and just like dumped a bunch of leaves on the forest floor of the mangrove, and they're, they're gone. They just gobble them up. It's like, kids it's candy they just gobble them up um and so they they eat leaves they also eat algae on the forest floor and they're also coprophagous which i'm not sure if, if uh how many know what that means but uh I, i'd have you google it but i'll just tell you it means that they eat their own poop uh so uh, i they are amazing but they're also gross um so but anyway they're important uh third group of crabs are the Scylla mud crabs. And these are much larger than the, the fiddler crabs or the, um, the, the Sasarma tree crabs. And uh, these are delicious. And they're important uh, to the communities that live near the mangroves, uh, such as my, this is my friend Maxon from Koshrai holding up a, a giant mud crab because they, they collect these and they sell them. Um, and so they provide a source of income. On, on his island alone, 50% of the annual income comes from the sale of these crabs. And so they sell them at uh, restaurants, at hotels. They actually uh, export them to other islands and sell them there as well. So uh, delicious um, crabs. And I'm gonna come, I'm gonna summarize their, their, all, all these organisms' importance here. I'm just sort of gonna go through a few more. Now this, I'm gonna shut the music off for a second. Not sure if this is gonna work, but this is a video and I want you to listen carefully. Uh, it's gonna be very faint. You're gonna hear a couple of sounds and, and I'm not talking, these are mud skippers, which I'll talk about here in a second, which are also incredibly cool. But there's a sound that I want you to see if you can pick up. I'm not sure if you will, but I'll play it. There it was. And there it was again. So I'm not sure if you heard it. I'm gonna play it again, but it's a it's a snap. It sounds like a snap.
Okay, and there it was again. So what that sound is, I remember the first time I walked into Manga Forest, I heard that. And I thought like my mom was standing next to me because when she chews her gum, she pops her gum and she snaps it really loud. And every time I walk into the forest, I think of my mom because I hear this snapping and this popping. And I, I didn't know what it was the first time until I looked into it. And what it is, is it, it's these guys. Now this is a shrimp in the family Alphiidae. Uh, their common name is a pistol shrimp or a snapping shrimp. And what's really cool about these shrimp, and they're only like maybe two to three centimeters long. They're not very big. And you can see in these pictures, which I didn't take, um, that one of their claws is about two to three times bigger than their other claw. And that large claw has a, has a one side of the claw has a cavity and the other side has a tooth. And when they snap that uh, claw together, it presses the tooth into the cavity and creates this bubble. And that bubble then uh, cavitates and it creates a, 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 what they call a microsonic boom. And that's the snap that we hear. And they use that to stun their prey. Uh, they snap, they sonic boom, and they stun their prey. And, uh, and then they can have a snack. But they also use it to warn as a warning mechanism. So whenever I enter the forest or anyone enters the forest, they hear us or they see us coming and they start to warn each other. And so you just hear this popping and the snapping throughout the mangrove forest. Now, if, if there are any scuba divers or any snorkelers uh, that are on the presentation, if you've ever been diving and, and you've heard this, what sounds like someone's got a, a roll of bubble wrap and they're popping it, it's these guys um, like snapping for the prey or they might be warning their friends that, that you're there uh, watching them. So uh, they're really cool, cool animals. And then uh, the last critter is this mud skipper. Uh, really pretty uh, mud skipper. This is from Vietnam, just beautiful turquoise markings. And this is really cool because they're not in water. This, this is a, a fish from the Gobiidae family, the Gobi family. And I could give a whole separate presentation on how cool gobies are. Maybe we can do that later, Liza. But what's cool about this particular goby is that they've evolved a, a, a flap that grows over their gills that allows that them to retain moisture in their gills. And so they can essentially, they're like, they're land fish and uh, their eyeballs are on top of their heads. And that sort of allows them to sort of uh, perch on logs and rocks and they can sort of keep track of where their predators are. Uh, really cool. And they skip across the mud, hence the name mud skippers. So quite a cool uh, group of, of animals um, living in the mangrove forest. And again, I said that there's sort of a mutualistic benefit there. Like their presence actually is good for the mangroves and it's largely, their activity on the forest, on the surface of the sediment creates bioturbation. And so it's a mixing of the sediments, getting oxygen into the sediments that the, that the plants like. Um, and if we take a look uh, at the, some of their burrows, uh, this is a fiddler crab burrow on the left and a sasarma crab burrow on the right. And the, the sasarma crab burrows are just incredibly, um, uh, they're just structurally complex and they can be meters deep. So people have poured uh, uh, plastic into these um, burrows and created these casts and just documented the complexity of these burrow networks. And what this does is it creates these giant straws into the sediment basically. And again, it allows oxygen to flow in and create these oxic areas that the plants like. But when the tide comes in and then the tide goes out, that water allows wastes to flush out of the mangrove as well. And so these Sasarma crabs, these, these fiddler crabs, um, these snapping shrimp are essentially sediment engineers. They're helping maintain the health of the sediment so that these trees again can survive. There's another organism, I, I forgot to put a picture of this, but it's a mud lobster. And these things, they build these huge burrows that I'm, I'm about two meters tall, six feet. And these, these burrows are easily a meter to three feet tall. And it, they're just amazing. Um, and again, sediment engineers, helping keep the sediment healthy, helping the mangrove thrive. And then the last kind of picture I want to share with you, I didn't take this one, but it just reminds me of a, of a, a time when I was in the field in the Philippines. This is a, a mangrove tree covered in fireflies. And there's also, there's a relationship between uh, fireflies and uh, specific, a, a certain species of mangrove tree. Um, where the, the fireflies will colonize the tree to mate. And we were working in the, as I mentioned, in the Philippines, and we sampled the mangrove forest and we came out 
and the tide had gone out. And so we were essentially stranded in the forest because uh, we were in a boat and uh, we couldn't get back to our car. So we just waited there until the tide came in. And by the time the tide had come in and we could take the boat out, it was nighttime. And it was like maybe a sliver of a moon. It was, it was dark, but you could still see like the, the shapes of the trees, uh, the, the shadows, the silhouettes of the trees. And so they fired up the boat and it was, I don't know what the name of this type of boat is, but it was a slow boat that made this like chuk, 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 like as we sort of chugged up the, the, the channel. And every time that motor would chuk, the, the channel, the whole creek would just light up with these uh, bioluminescent uh, bacteria and jellyfish that harbor these um, uh, bioluminescent organisms. So basically, as they're swimming, they can turn this light on and it basically uh, gets rid of their shadow from, from any light source above like a moon. So that uh, prevents them from being eaten by predators that are on the bottom of the creek. And so it's just, I'm just mesmerized by this like strobe light effect on the, on the tidal creek and this channel. And, and there are also mullet, which is a fish that uh, have these like light organs on, on their undersides. And you can see them swimming up in the, in the tidal creek. It was, it was absolutely amazing. And we came around this bend and I thought, this one tree was like lit up and I thought there were maybe some fishermen with uh, flashlights on these trees and I, I couldn't figure out why, what they would be doing. Why would they be shining this light? And as we got closer, I realized it was a single tree and it was like somebody had wrapped this tree with like a million strands of Christmas lights. Like every branch, every twig, every leaf on this, this tree was lit up. I felt like I was in that movie Avatar and uh, it was just one tree. And it was, I mean, this picture is pretty, but this actual, what we saw in the field, it, this picture pales in comparison because it was just amazing. And it turns out it was an exocaria tree um, that they like to colonize because we came back the next day um, and I could, I could see the tree and there was just one of them. And so exocaria, for any of you that are familiar with uh, mangrove um, species, I think this is a, only found in the Indo-West Pacific and it's got the white milky sap. If you, if you scratch it, it'll have a white milky sap. And if you get that sap in your eye, it causes temporary blindness. And apparently it's also a natural, uh, has a, uh, it functions similarly as Viagra uh, or so I've been told. So that brings us to the end of Mangrove 101. And I thought I would, uh, Hopefully you guys all enjoy that as much as I did. That was fun. Uh, I'm gonna, I think I, I'm, I'm, I have, I'm good on time still. You do. Okay. Now I'm gonna, I'm just gonna kind of change topics a little bit. Um, you know, so we, I think we all appreciate mangroves. We know they're, they're mangrovey and um, they're awesome. But unfortunately they, uh, have pretty have had a high rate of deforestation since the 1980s. I think we've lost something in the order of 30 to 40 percent of our our mangroves around the world, uh, as you can see in this uh, map here. It's kind of outdated. Uh, we need to generate a newer one. I couldn't find one, but we we definitely have seen a lot of loss of mangrove forests, particularly in Asia. Um, fortunately, that rate has slowed down. I think as people have started to recognize the value of mangroves, there's been stricter conservation. Uh, policies put in place and also a lot of restoration, which I'll talk about here in a second. But, but still, uh, they're still threatened um, by uh, several factors. And so probably the biggest factor that has resulted in the loss of mangroves has been aquaculture. And I should just say ag agriculture, uh, but definitely aquaculture was a big one. You can see here, this is from the Philippines. Uh, that entire mangrove was converted to shrimp ponds um, or brackish water ponds, because they also raise fish in some of these as well. And you can see in the graph on the bottom, um, you know, this solid line represents mangrove area, which uh, significantly declined in the 80s as these brackish water ponds increased. And so a farmer will make, or a landowner will make a pond, they're only productive really for four or five years, and then they'll abandon it, and they'll move on to another pond, uh, uh, they'll clear another area, create another pond. And as a result, we've seen massive losses of, uh, of mangroves. And I said agriculture. So in Myanmar, a big threat to the mangroves has been rice production. So they've converted a lot of their mangroves in Myanmar into rice fields. Um, another big agricultural threat has been, uh, believe it or not, oil palm. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, terrestrial forest and uh, peatland swamp converted to oil palm, uh, which makes sense because uh, it's 
uh, drier soils and it's fresh water. But mangroves, is, it's saltier. So I was always sort of shocked when I heard that oil palm was a big threat, but we're seeing a lot of it start to emerge, uh, again, particularly in Southeast Asia. And they're not as productive as some of these other oil palm uh, plantations that they grow in uh, peatland swamps or in the upland forests, uh, but it's enough to entice the farmers to clear the mangroves and plant um, oil palm. Another big threat is charcoal production. Um, and so in um, Cambodia, this was a, a big driver of deforestation of mangroves where they were producing charcoal from the trees that they cut down that they would clear cut these forests. Uh, it's still a big issue in Africa. This, these are pictures from Madagascar, uh, where even though it's um, illegal to cut mangroves, we still stumble across these. This is a kiln here on the right. They basically cut the tree in place, cut it up and light it on fire and then bury it and then let it sort of smolder until it forms uh, this charcoal. And this is a big, it's a big concern because especially in Madagascar and I'm sure in several other other countries but Madagascar something like 80 to 90 percent of the people don't have electricity and so they need to cook their food and so we're trying to we're working with the university there and, and the government to try to figure out if there's a sustainable management can they sustainably harvest like either a few of the trees or maybe a portion of the tree and still have this this firewood um, as well as maintaining their forest so it's, it's a big concern and, and, and a need to balance uh, human livelihood and use with, with mangrove forest function. Another big threat kind of related to that is just illegal logging. So uh, people have gone in and cleared the forests uh, for the timber, which it's a, it's a pretty um, remarkable uh, timber. It, it's, it's rot resistant, it's insect resist resistant, it's really sturdy hardwood, good for building. Um, a lot of mangroves uh, in Latin America were deforested when the Spanish arrived. Uh, because they used it to build their armada because the the boats were built from the mangrove the wood harvested from these mangrove trees again because they're 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 rot resistant they're they're just really good uh, uh for building things that last a long time uh another impact is altered hydrology and so i i mentioned that the trees have have adapted to be able to live in these saturated conditions but they can't be permanently flooded I mean, they, they need the, they still need to breathe. So if you alter the hydrology through a bridge um, or a, a dam and that, that water is standing there, the trees will die and they will drown. And this is, you can see that here, these are uh, two Pacific islands. On the left here is Pohnpei and this landowner drug, uh, dredged a channel through this mangrove and created a berm so he could get his tractor out there to dredge the channel. And as a result, he blocked uh, a creek that was right about here and all of these mangroves, about half a hectare died as a result of that because of the standing water. Um, this is Babeldob, same thing. They built a road in front of these mangroves. Uh, they didn't have any culvert or bridge and you got all the standing water and all the trees died. Uh, so uh, they can tolerate being flooded, but they don't like to be permanently flooded because they will drown, which relates uh, to this uh, final impact here, which is sea level rise, which is predicted to be probably the biggest threat that mangroves will face in the not so near future. No, oh, excuse me, in the near future. Um, and so we know that the current rate of sea level rise is about twice that of what we had seen in most of the 20th century. So we, we've seen an, already seeing an increase in sea level rise and we've uh, tried to predict what it will look like under various scenarios. And they think it will rise by either 37 to 250 centimeters by 2100. Um, although there's a lot of uncertainty in these models, so we're not really sure uh, which, which one is most likely to happen, but still the possibility. Um, so that, that's a big, big concern. So what, what does that mean for, for, for mangroves? And again, we know that they've adapted to live in, and be, to be able to live in conditions that are flooded. Some trees are better than others. And so if you look at this cross section of a mangrove here, as we get closer to the ocean, we get species in this, in this pioneer zone right behind the mudflat. You get species like uh, from Sonoradia or Rhizophora that can tolerate being flooded twice a day, every day. Um, they're, they're totally okay with that. And then as we get closer inland to this sort of back mangrove area, this upper portion, we get species Brugiera, that xylocarpus, that ribbon root tree that I showed you. Um, they don't like to be flooded that often. They can tolerate, you know, maybe being flooded twice a day, but maybe 
I don't know, 10 days out of the month. Not every day for sure. If, if, they, if they do, they, they are not very happy. And so with sea level rise, what we'll see is uh, a, a movement inland, uh, a shift in vegetation, uh, and, and the shift in the community composition of the species that are growing there. And so uh, closer to the ocean, we'll probably see uh, loss of trees, and then those, those species will probably mig migrate inland. Um, and the, the issue with this, you know, a thousand years ago, this, this was fine because there weren't a lot of humans a lot of, not a lot of development behind mangroves, but now we've got roads, villages uh, behind these mangroves. And so as the mangroves start to move inland, we'll see coastal squeeze because they won't be able to migrate further than the, the roads or bridges. And so we need to take that into consideration as we start to design some more of these structures or design communities around mangroves. Now, mangroves are dynamic ecosystems and they've survived sea level rise in the past. And I was gonna make this a quiz slide and I forgot to do that. Um, but uh, you can see that, um, that mangroves can keep up with sea level rise by maintaining, so as sea level rises, they can maintain their forest floor elevation. And that again is through uh, processes that we discussed earlier. Like it's this root growth where the roots are, are sort of lying on top of each other and accumulating, you get this peat accumulation, or it's the trapping of sediments. And so this allows a mangrove to keep up with sea level rise. The question is, you know, will they be able to keep up with increased rates that are predicted to occur over the next century? We're not sure. And can they keep up in the presence of humans? And so uh, some of the work that we do, some of the research is monitoring this. So we've installed equipment in mangroves across the Pacific uh, called rod surface elevation tables. And you basically haul a jackhammer and a generator, like really big heavy equipment through all that mucky mud that I showed you. And uh, you pile drive this rod through the peat until it hits the point of refusal. So this, this peat's developed over either ancient coral or basalt rock. And once that uh, is fixed, then you attach this arm, the surface elevation table arm, and you lower these pins through the arm uh, to measure the height of the forest floor relative to the height of the arm. And so we come back every year and we remeasure it, and we can track whether the forest is increasing or decreasing relative to sea level rise. And this is important because as a manager, if you've got a forest that's keeping up with sea level rise, it's resilient, and you want to conserve that system and make sure that it maintains that. And if it's not, then you need to figure out well, what's going on. What type of restoration or what management action can we do to increase the resilience of that system? Okay, the next topic I would, I'd like to discuss is, is mangrove restoration. So we've, we've seen uh, mangroves have been degraded, that degradation, that rate of degradation has significantly slowed over the last decade because of these restoration efforts. So countries, policymakers, uh, government organizations, NGOs are starting to appreciate the value that mangroves are providing. And so they have funded these massive projects to offset the losses that we've seen, um, but also to increase the carbon stock. So a lot of these, these countries, you know, we have to report our greenhouse gas emissions. And so we can offset those greenhouse gas emissions by increasing our mangrove forest uh, cover because they, they just remove and store so much uh, carbon compared to other forested systems. And people are starting to recognize the value of mangroves at providing storm protection. So as a result, we see a lot, we've seen a lot of restoration. Unfortunately, most of these restoration projects have been plantations. And so projects will go out and they will create a monotypic plantation. So they'll plant one species and often it's, it's the wrong species. Actually, often it's rhizophora because the, those long pickle cigar shaped propagules are really easy to pick off the trees. They're, and so they'll harvest those, they'll plant them in the wrong zone. So again, if you remember that zone uh, picture I showed you about sea level rise, they'll plant them in areas that are too low and, and the trees will die. And something on the order of 70 to 90% or 80 to 90% of these restoration projects have failed according to our friend Dom um, from the Mangrove Action Plan. Uh, mangrove action project. And this is a picture from him. Uh, you can see these little uh, stakes in the sediment and there should be a seedling associated with each one of those. 
And I can maybe see two or three right here that have survived. So not a very effective way to restore mangrove forests. Good intentions, but um, not effective. Um, and here's another uh, picture of a restoration site. Uh, and one thing that I forgot to mention when I was talking about the propagules that these trees produce, uh, and that is they produce thousands of propagules. And it's, you know, because they're, they're dispersing away from the tree or they're dispersing right near the tree. So if you come to a mud flat and it's next to a mangrove site like this, and there are no seedlings, there's no natural regeneration, then that should tell you something that the site is not right for mangroves because this tree right here is producing thousands of propagules, but I don't see any baby mangrove trees in the mud flat. But regardless, people still planted them here and all of these seedlings died. This is another slide that Dominic shared with us. Um, I think this was a project they were trying to break a Guinness Book of World Record. Um, I think that was what, what was part of the drive for this project, but they wanted, they planted 1 million propagules in one hour. So 7,000 people volunteered uh, to go out there and they planted these propagules. And then Dominic went back four years later and found that only 1.9, only like 2% of the trees died. So that's about 20,000 trees, which is still, I guess it's better than no trees, but that's not a good return on a, on a million propagules planted. So again, um, they're planting in front of these mangroves in this mud flat in areas that are, there's, there's water, standing water here, which suggests that that's a bad place because the trees are gonna drown. Another point is that there, there should be natural regeneration there if that site is suitable for mangroves, but it's not. And that's why that failed. So MAP has uh, Allison Saracena who's on the call. Uh, she and I uh, just completed uh, our first Pacific mangrove restoration workshop with MAP um, it was a, a forest service MAP joint effort. And we provided this training to Pacific Islanders on how to more effectively restore their sites. And it was a, it was a great workshop. Uh, we learned a lot about uh, you know, key things like including the community, getting com community buy-in, getting community engagement. How do they use the forest? How do they manage the forest? What does the forest mean to them? Um, but also like looking at the cause of the degradation. Why is the site degraded? Why isn't there natural regeneration? And so a lot of times you can restore a site by either restoring the hydrology, by um, conditioning the sediments. Um, you can restore a site without planting a single tree. And this is a great example here. This is from the late Roy Lewis, who is basically the, he's the father of this ecological mangrove restoration. Um, and he basically, this is from Florida. I think there was a, a road built on the left here in the upper left photograph and a bunch of, a large area of mangroves died. And so he went in, restored the channel, uh, graded the, the sediment. So it was equivalent, it was equal to the forests adjacent to the degraded area. And then after about two years, he started to see natural regeneration of forest. And after five years, he's got these nice uh, saplings growing here and today, it's a, it's a beautiful mangrove forest. And again, he didn't plant a single, he didn't plant a single tree. And so we're, we're developing better science for more effective restoration. Um, but the question still remains is, do these restored sites function similar to intact mangroves? Do they provide us with the same levels of goods and services? And that's what we're starting to ask. Now we're starting to look into that. Um, we set up several projects, uh, in the Pacific uh, to focus on carbon. So do restored sites store as much carbon as intact ones? And we found that they do, but after uh, we found anywhere from 25 to 35 years. And so I'm sorry, I, I have to present some graphs because I'm a scientist with Forest Service and that's, uh, that's what I have to do. Um, and you can see on the y-axis here uh, is carbon stock. So this is the amount of carbon that's stored in the site. And then we have all of our sites here on the x-axis on this horizontal bar. And we had six sites that were in plantations, areas that were planted, and we had nine sites in areas that had naturally regenerated. And we found that in both of those sites, uh, the average carbon was about 900 uh, tons of carbon or megagrams of carbon per hectare. And when we compare that uh, to intact sites uh, in Vietnam, 
they have they store about 900 tons of carbon as well. So a little bit lower in the restored sites, but if you look at the error, there was no significant difference. So after about 35 years, we see that these sites uh, are, are similar. And then uh, this is another example from Cambodia, where we've got, again, the amount of carbon on the y-axis and then our types of sites on the x-axis. So we've got our intact uh, on the far left and the restored on the far right. And again, and these restored sites were 25 years old. And so no significant difference after 25 years in these restored sites. And I should point out again too that uh, most of the carbon is stored below ground in the soils and the sediments, which are these, I can go back here. It's these, these hashed lines here represent the carbon that's stored in the soil. So something on the order of 90% of the carbon that we sampled is stored below ground. And as well as here. I have a feather bow on and one of my COVID cats is eyeing me like I'm a giant, um, I'm a giant bird. So I might, I might be attacked here in a minute. Um, okay, so I, I, I kind of want to wind things down here. You guys have been a, a great audience. I hope you've enjoyed this and it hasn't been too sciencey and, and been, been able to incorporate some fun into it. And, and we're still not done. We still have an, an activity at the end here, but I want to revisit this ecosystem services because there's one service that I didn't really talk about uh, and I can't remember if anybody brought this up, but that would be human livelihoods. So mangroves uh, improve human livelihoods. And this is through a lot of the, the products that um, are harvested from the mangroves. And, and as I've gone to, to these mangrove meetings over the last decade, I've met these incredible um, uh, groups of women, these women's groups that have realized that if they go into the forest, there's other products that they can harvest beside uh, crabs and shrimp, clams and, and, and trees. And they're starting to make soap from products that they've harvested in the mangrove. And they, they're selling them in their communities and actually online, you can buy them online. Uh, probably one of my favorite uh, products is honey. And so uh, these women's groups are, are creating these, uh, I think they're called apiaries. I think Liza correct said that that was the term where they're raising bees in the mangroves and they're producing delicious honey. And I think some of the most delicious honey I, I've had was from uh, the Bitter Konica Forest Reserve uh, in um, uh, Orissa in, in India. And it was, it was grown in this Candelia forest and it was just incredible flavor uh, of this honey. So they're, they're making money from that. Uh, I was at a meeting in Bali one time and I came around the corner and there was this uh, another woman's group there that uh, were making uh, batiks. And the batiks were stained with uh, dyes that they had harvested from the mangroves, from the leaves, from the bark, from the fruits. And they were just incredibly gorgeous uh, uh, batik uh, pieces of art. Very inspiring. I ended up purchasing one that I, I gave to, to my partner for, for Christmas. This, you can see it here. Uh, she also uh, studies mangroves. So, um, uh, so I, hence the, the, the idea of getting this for her. Uh, but just really incredible artwork. Um, and again, it inspired me as like as a person, not just as a scientist, but to, to re recognize the the beauty of the forest and the products that you can you can get from them, and also just the beauty of the art uh, that is made about the mangroves. And so, I started to bring uh, watercolors with me. I start to I I bring watercolors with me now when I go into the field, and. When I'm done, either with the campaign or sometimes at the end of the day, I can decompress uh, by creating these watercolor paintings. And uh, it's just really, I found it's, it really has helped me appreciate the forest and to see the beauty in these systems even more than I already do. Uh, and it's just a fun activity. And, and at the end of the day, you've got a piece of art that you can put on your refrigerator. Um, and then this, this middle framed one is a piece that I made with garbage that I collected uh, along the coast. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if you can see that or not, but uh, anyway, another piece of art that I made uh, inspired again from this, these uh, women's groups that were, this women's group that was making these batiks. And so when Liza approached me and she asked me if I could give, she's like, can you give us a presentation? And I was like, yeah, I'd love to give a presentation on, on mangroves. And then she followed up and she's like, well, I want you to incorporate art. And I was like, okay, I had to think about how to do that. And then it, it, it occurred to me that art is already a big part of, of what I do. Um, and I thought, well, maybe 
after hearing me talk for how long have I been talking? Uh, for like an hour, I think. Maybe we could uh, work together and make our own piece of artwork. And so at this point, um, I'm going to hand it back to Liza, my partner in crime. Thanks, I'm gonna, Rich. I'm going to stop sharing. And yeah, I'll let you explain the next. Perfect. So we're going to do communal art now, um, inspired by Rich. And I just want to say um, big round of applause, Rich McKenzie. That was amazing. If I had had you as a professor in, <laughs> in college, I think uh, I would have been out there with you in the muds and playing around there. So thank you so much for that. Um, just a few questions that we had in the chat, Rich, and maybe we could, you could pull up the whiteboard. And then as we're doing our art, I can, we can ask you questions. Yes. And I'm glad that you haven't yet been attacked by your cats. There's still, there's the heart from the test earlier today. Is that, can you see that? Mm-hmm. So cool. everyone who wants to participate, if you go up uh, in, on your screen and to view options and click on annotate, you can participate in the drawing, you can add text, you can do whatever you want and we will then take a picture of that and send it out. So as you're doing that, Rich, we've got a few questions. The first, let me start with the last one. The honey from Alejandro, he has a question, was it stinky? No, you mean like like stinky? Like it didn't smell like farts or anything. It smelled like honey. It was it was really good. It was like uh, it just had a lot of flavor um, uh, that I can't. I'm not good at describing that thing. Like what you know when you buy coffee and they're like, oh, it's got flavors of cherries and apricots. Mm -hmm. I can never taste that. But it, I'm telling you, like it was it was not like regular honey I bought at the store. It was just really rich and flavorful. Nice. But it was, it was not stinky. Unless you think honey is stinky, then it might be. That's awesome. And awesome you know, about a crab. Yeah, Lucre Lucretia and I were, you know, still um, amazed that there are, you can get honey from a mangrove forest. So that was a, a nice surprise today. I wanted to go to Jim Barber's question on what is the ecological advantage of the crab's coloring, unique coloring? That's a great question. Um, and the only answer I have uh, was this paper that I read that has to do with, with uh, ability to detect each other um, while mating. And so I think it's, it's a visual cue. I mean, because it, they're not really camouflaging themselves in, in the gray brown mud. Uh, so there's really no, doesn't seem like there's a cryptic benefit of it, but I, I read a, a study that they, um, <laughs> I'm I'm la cuz I remember how they did the study but they they determined that the color helps them I think find mates and it has to do with uh, mate selection. So uh so it's it's not really cryptic it's more about mating and the way that they did it cuz I thought well how do they know it's not they're not attracted to them you know through like a pheromone or something and I think they like made like cut out pictures of crabs and like colored them and then like did like observations and determined like how often they went after the colored the pretty colored ones versus the non-colored ones so but i bet you there's other reasons too we just haven't haven't really uh we're at the tip of the iceberg on that yeah that's great rich i was just wondering because i've only been in mangroves a few times and you know they've always been pretty bland and and dark and i've never noticed the coloring before um but it's mostly been in the wet environment because i'd been you know in a canoe or kayak or something so cool thanks yeah there and the other cool thing jim is that uh like I, I haven't seen, a, I haven't been, I, I mean, I've spent most of my career in the Indo-West Pacific, uh, you know, in the past maybe five years, I've worked, started to work more in, in Latin America and Africa. Uh, I don't see the same coloration uh, in Africa. I do, but I had, when, when we were working in Mexico and in Honduras, I just, I don't see this or in Florida, even, I don't see the same coloration. I don't, I don't know if it's, it has to do with that, that uh, Indo-West Pacific versus Atlantic Eastern Pacific uh, split in the mangroves, but one one other thing I noticed. But great question. 
Um, great, thank you, Jim. And Kathy, I'm not sure if you're still on, uh, if you wanted to ask your question about agriculture uh, and how they flush the salt from the soils. Do you wanna clarify that a little? Yeah, uh, hi, and thanks for a really great presentation and, and uh, the emerging artwork here. Thanks everyone. <laughs> um, no, my, my question was in the agriculture, you know, in, in that sort of agriculture, things happen really fast. And of course these soils are salt saturated and, and they're growing things that wouldn't do well in that. How do they, how do they flush that salt so quickly? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great, uh, great question. I think uh, it's altering the hydrology. So they will build uh, uh, walls that the tides can't come in and then they divert fresh water into them. I mean, especially for the rice systems to flush it out. I still like, I don't know how they grow the oil palm. I'm still baffled at that. Um, I'm, there's probably papers out there and I just haven't had a chance to read them. But I remember a couple of years ago at, I think it was at IUFRO, somebody presented, it was Dan, a buddy of mine, Dan Fries, presented that um, oil palm is like becoming a huge issue. And I'm like, how can that be? Like the oil palm is not, they, they aren't adapted to live in these salty situations, but I, I think it has to do with blocking the, the incoming tide and then diverting fresh water flow. But it clearly, I mean, the, they, they can apparently grow in those conditions, but I don't think they're growing as well as if you planted them in like a, a drained peat swamp or in an upland uh, terrestrial forest as, as I like to call them. Um, uh, yeah, but that's a great question. I'm not sure if I answered that or not, but that's, that's to, to my knowledge, that's how I, I believe they, they condition these systems in order to grow rice or freshwater plants. Thank you. Kathy, did you have any other questions you wanted to ask? Uh, I'll, I'll just say that um, long ago and far away, I'm, I'm speaking from Seattle, where I now live, but long ago and far away, I lived in Key West. And uh, as a young biologist did a little bit of mangrove revegetation, it, it largely failed as we discovered, um, but it, it afforded me the time to be snorkeling in and around the roots. I lived on a sailboat, so we relied on being near mangroves for dinner on occasion while on the boat. And this was just a wonderful reminder of some of those experiences. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad that uh, they enjoyed it. And that really helped put into context a lot of your awesome comments, Kathy. Um, never knew what a propagula, can't even pronounce it until today. Um, let's see, we have a question from Tamara about your that rod set. How much does it weigh? Ah. Uh... I, I would have to estimate, I haven't, I haven't weighed them, but they're, they're heavy. Um, so w when you actually do the installation, you've got the, the generator is probably 50 pounds. The jackhammer is probably 50 pounds. And then um, the rods themselves, they're, they're uh, four foot long uh, or 1.2 meters long and they screw together. And so you carry a box out there and each box weighs about I would say 20 to 25 pounds, they're heavy. Um, and uh, and you need, I mean, the deepest site I've sunk was 20 rods. So that's like, um, you know, each each rod is a, is, a, is a meter. So it's greater than 20 meters or greater than 60 feet. That's how, it's amazing that the, the, yeah. this peat accumulation, like it's, I mean, it's been there for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, I'm diverting the, the question. So, uh, that is, is, would be a good idea the way, but I mean, once you go out there, the rods are installed. You don't have to carry them back to the boat. You just have to carry the generator and the jackhammer, which are heavy. And then when you come back to read the rod, you use an arm and that arm is pretty light. It's like know, five pounds maybe, but we carry it, um, it. The, the company that it builds them, they put them in gun cases. And so uh, you get a lot of weird looks when you're going into the mangrove with the gun case, especially if it's like an area where you're not supposed to hunt mm -hmm. and, or get, or if you try to get on an airplane with it too, that's always fun. Oh my gosh. Thank you for that. Right. Was that t Tamara that asked that? Mm -hmm. From Puerto Rico? Yeah. Hola. If you want to, uh, any R sets installed tomorrow, 
Let's talk. Yes, we'll talk about it, especially right. in restoration sites. Cool. Thanks, Rich. Awesome. Glad to hear your voice. Um, Rich Christian, who I think is in Hawaii, so it's pretty early there right now. Yeah. Um, are there mangrove species that can grow upland? That's a great question. Uh, yeah, there are actually. Um, uh, we sampled some out in Pompeii. Uh, it was uh, uh, in the Rhizophraceae family, and my colleague Wayne pointed out to me that it's a it is a um, it is an upland species. Uh, but most of the species, like if you tried to plant uh, a propagule, they still need water. Like they, they, I don't I don't think they would. If you just tried to plant them like in your front yard, I don't think they would grow very well because uh, they still do need some some water, uh, even though they're adapted to tolerate like extreme conditions. But they do need at least some amount of, of water. Perfect. And then Alejandro is asking: Is Conocarpus erectus a true mangrove? Uh, some people think that it is, and some people think that it's not. I would probably call it uh, an associate it tends and to be what more is that? It, it's a it's a type it's a tree a mangrove tree it tends to dry it grow in drier areas uh, where I've sampled it perfect wow, but you know what it? let's just call them all mangroves you know mm -hmm. the, let's just all let's be inclusive and mangrove whether you're a true mangrove or an associate you're a mangrove in my book and that's, you're worth that's saving the grooviest thing you've ever said here today yeah right. Um, let's see, we've got, oh, our artwork is coming along beautifully. And as we're wrapping that up, does anybody else have any other questions for Rich? I'm seeing a lot of love for the mangroves, Rich. That's me. <laughs> oh, that uh, question. May I throw out a question, Kathy Wolf? Yes, please, Kathy. Uh, so I have had time in and around mangroves. I now am far away from them. What would you suggest that any of us could do now that we've developed a deep love for mangroves? What can we do to help with all this, even though we don't live in these places where restoration, policy, those things really are necessary? A great question. Um... I think... I, uh, this might be one of the easiest things you could do. I mean, it depends, I guess, on what, what you like to eat. Uh, but you could stop consuming shrimp. Um, or you could be, uh, and I bet most people here already, already do this, but um, just be aware of where your shrimp are coming from. And because that is the biggest, um, I think it's one of the biggest threats still to mangroves is shrimp aquaculture. And I know they, they've developed, there's companies have gone in and they're trying to integrate the shrimp farms with the mangroves. So there are like organic shrimp uh, that you can, you can um, buy that has less of an impact. But I think that might be um, one thing you could do. Um, you know, and, unless you're already, if you're a vegetarian, then that would, <clears throat> is an easy thing that you could do. Uh, you know, I was thinking about this too when I was searching for images of, of products. I think you could you could purchase mangrove uh, products, sustainable product products like honey or soap uh, online would be another way to support some of these groups. And then, um, yeah, I think that that those are some solutions I I, I can provide. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question though. But I know like when when I started to do research in mangroves 20 years ago and found out about the shrimp ponds. That was one of the first things that we stopped doing is, is eating shrimp and finding out where it's coming from. Thanks. And I, I know, Rich, you have, uh, we, you created a, like a 15 minute um, video for us for Beyond Trees a year and a half ago. And I'll put that link in the chat. Um, and those also have some tips for how one can help. Um, and I think in that video, you also mentioned about um, really you know, trash, being mindful of trash and uh, the sea level rise, especially with the trash and seeing where they end up when the tide ebbs. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah, that's, yeah. 
yeah, plastic. Uh, <clears throat> stop using plastic. That's a great one, Liza. I, that we have. Uh, we had a have a site in Indonesia and in, in Sumatra. Oh, no, sorry, not Sumatra, in Sulawesi, and we have sites uh, also in northern Vietnam. And I just I can't believe the amount of garbage that's in these systems. And as Liza said, like you know, there's like a rack mark on the tree where you can go out and you can see how high the tide is. Well, you can use garbage as that as that point of reference. Like literally, the tidal, I think the tide height is a meter in northern Vietnam, and there's a meter high of garbage, like stuck, like plastic bags. Um, plastic containers. Uh, there's just the whole like rack line on the, on the in, uh, inside of the mangrove is like is water bottles, plastic water bottles, motor scooter helmets, plastic parts. So reduced plastic consumption would be a big way too. Not just for mangroves. It's for well, life. Yeah, life. A uh, few more. We have Tamberly. Rich, um, have you seen issues with diseases within the mangrove ecosystems from shrimp aquaculture farms? Um, I haven't, but I don't, that doesn't mean that that's not there. And that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, you get these, these shrimp ponds fail is they get disease in there and then the, the population collapse. And then it's, I guess it, it's left over in the, um, in the soils, but I haven't seen like any, any impact on terms of like restoration sites that that affects the ability to restore the site. Only well, the effect I've seen is on the actual shrimp themselves. Thank you. And uh, as a follow-up question, can you share where you are working in Mexico? In Mexico, uh, we are working in um, uh, down in uh, Laguna Bacalar in Bacalar, um, and so the there are um, these amazing freshwater mangroves. If you've ever been to Bacalar, Laguna Bacalar is this freshwater lagoon that's sort of, it's somewhat isolated from the coast, but it still gets water input, but it's all freshwater. Um, but that, that you, the Yucatan Peninsula is, is calcium carbonate. And so you get all these massive amounts of like uh, groundwater coming into the system and it's super saturated in calcium carbonate. And so I think what happens is, and so if you've been there, it's this amazing, blue lagoon because of the sediments are white because when the the spring water comes out this cold spring water comes out and it becomes warm the calcium carbonate precipitates out and you get this like stunning white sediment and uh but there's still a lot of calcium carbonate in the water so even though it's fresh water uh mangroves can grow there i think it's because of the calcium carbonate there's they're confused they think it's salt but it's not it's fresh with with calcium carbonate so um there, we studied the mangroves there, and then if you drive out uh, to the coast, uh, there are a couple of sites um, that we've sampled with our, our friends uh, uh, at, at Ecosur. Um, and I can't, there are names that he's given them, like it's a depressional mangrove. So it's along that coast there, like just above um, Belize. Thanks, Rich. I'm going to entertain a few more questions here, and then we'll have to wrap it up. Um, after a hurricane, what is the major cause of mangrove death? Freshwater input, wind, or coastal flooding? It depends. Um, there was a study that came out in the Caribbean that found that the flooding that res resulted this, from the ocean killed the mangroves, it drowned them. Um, so that, that can be a cause. Uh, the snapping of the forests, uh, the tree stumps, um, if the wind damage is great enough, uh, can also kill the, 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 the forest, primarily because uh, what happens, and I, I didn't get into this, but, um, you know, we talked about like the elevation of the forest floor. That's how the mangroves can keep up with sea level rises by growing their forest floor, by growing roots. And if you kill uh, even a, a few trees in the forest, what happens is you get peak collapse because the roots die. Um, if you kill a large area of trees, you get an even bigger peak collapse. And so what happens uh, in some of these uh, hurricanes and typhoons is you get massive snapping of, of trees, massive death, and then the peak collapses, and then it basically there's standing water there. And so the sites can't recolonize because it's either standing water or it's, it's too low now for trees to recover. Um, so uh, 
I, I guess it's it's a, it's a mix. It, it depends. I don't know if there's a definitive answer. It's a great question, but I think it depends on on the conditions of the site and what happened. But it could be either fresh water, it could be wind, it could be salt water, or it could be a combination of all three of those. Thanks, Rich. So here's what I'm going to do, if it's okay with Rich and those who've asked some questions that haven't been asked right now, if you can stay on um, for a little while after we close this, then we can answer some of your questions. Would that be okay, Dr. Rich? Sure. Great. So we can entertain Rosanna's and Juan's and Tamberley's questions. Um, I do want to close off the beautiful art. I'm going to take a picture of it because I never know if I can record this. So those who want to take a picture, feel free to do that now. And I am going to, um, if you can stop sharing your screen, Rich, and then right. I'm going to pull up a couple of things that I think um, you all might like. Let's see, share screen. Here we go. So coming up, we have a really great webinar coming up next Thursday. Um, and it is a joint Beyond Trees Network, the newly minted Forest Landscape Restoration Alumni Network and International Day of Forest. The theme is um, restoration. So do please join us. And in the chat, I will put the link to the registration. Uh, for it, it is a two hour long series and features folks from India, Lebanon and World Wildlife Fund. And we have other upcoming events here. We have on March 22nd on World Water Day, um, harvesting and conserving water across urban landscapes. Then on the 26th, we have Dr. Greg Butcher on urban birds and conservation. And then at the end of the month, we do have another workshop on the tools used regularly now to see who's using and how is the landscape being used on social assessment. And if you want to find out more about Beyond Trees, you can visit our Facebook page, be part of our group, join our LinkedIn page, and of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel. So with that said, let me just uh, put this in the chat right now and if there are any, while I'm doing that um, if there are any comments or if you just want to say hi to Dr.